From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. Welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. In six weeks, on Tuesday, November 8th, voters across Idaho will head to the polls in the general election to decide on who they want to represent them in key federal and state offices. The next two viewpoints are focusing on one of the big races here, the race for lieutenant governor between longtime Speaker of the House, Republican Representative Scott Bedke of Oakley, and Democrat Terry Pickens Manweiler of Boise. Next week, Pickens Manweiler will be my guest. She is an attorney who says she's running because she believes it's time for change in Idaho. We'll hear why she believes that's the case, plus her priorities and stances on the big issues affecting the people of Idaho and her view on the role of the lieutenant governor. Today, Speaker of the House Scott Betke is up first. He describes himself as a pro-life, pro-gun, and limited government constitutional conservative. Bedke has served in the Idaho House of Representatives since 2000 and as Speaker since 2012. He is the longest serving Speaker in Idaho history. And his family's roots in Idaho date back to the 1870s when his great grandfather homesteaded in Oakley. Bedke is a cattle rancher, a husband, a father of four, and a grandfather of 14. Today, we'll get to hear Speaker Bedke's priorities and stances on the big issues and his view on the role of the Lieutenant Governor. So first of all, good morning, Mr. Speaker. Thanks for being here today. It is my pleasure to be here. Well, first of all, why are you running <clears throat> for Lieutenant Governor? Well, I've accumulated a lot of experience in the state legislature, and I, and I want to use that experience in, the, in this next role as Lieutenant Governor. I'll be doing what I've always done, and that is to promote Idaho to solve problems that face us. You know, we've, our state has been discovered and there's not, and we don't get to go back. And so this is going to create some growing pains in the, in, in the areas of infrastructure. Uh, and I'm very well acquainted with that and the natural resource side of that, as well as transportation. But I also have a good background in education because we want to have a positive business climate here. But, but education is an important component mm -hmm. of a positive business climate. And so I want to bring that expertise to the executive branch and keep Idaho on the positive trajectory that it's on. You know, speakers. Some would argue the second most powerful position in the <clears throat> state with the, you know, the power to direct legislation, yeah. set policy. And so I'm curious why you would give that up for the part-time position. Of well, as you said up. earlier, I'm the longest serving speaker in state history. And, uh, but, I am, but I am well prepared to go into the executive branch uh, where we execute, where we get things done. And uh, you're not so much passing the laws, but you're executing that. And I think that uh, my experience as a problem solver will be well suited for the executive branch. How do you view the role of the lieutenant governor? Well, I, I view it as I, like I, uh, you know, I bring the same attitude and the same uh, perspective as I bring to the speakership. There's nothing special about a state legislator other than we're in a position to help. We're in a position to solve problems. I have a, a, a proven track record of being able to mediate complicated issues and bring people together. And I think that that's what the, the office of the lieutenant governor needs to be. You're one heartbeat away from being the governor. Mm -hmm. but, but that heart is going to continue to beat and I will be a help and an extension of the governor. Uh, there's, this is a large state, it's a diverse state. We both can't be in, in every place at the same time. And, uh, and, I, uh, and I think he could use the help. We need, we need to also restore the dignity to the office of, of Lieutenant Governor, and I believe I can do that. Well, speaking of that, we have seen the relationship between Governor Little and Lieutenant Governor McGee and has been contentious. I mean, she ran against him in the primary for governor. So if you win and if the governor is reelected, then how will your working relationship be? Well, I've worked well with four governors, and uh, but that's not, but in my position as a legislator and later the speaker, I was never in a rubber stamping capacity, nor will I be in the future. But I think that uh, my diligence that I bring to issues, which is background, study, understanding, and then we sit around a table and we dissect the issues, we exchange ideas, and uh, from those ideas we get a path forward. And I understand who the number one is, and I understand the concept of writing for the brand. You know, that's what I do in real life. And that means the, the, we work for the people of Idaho. So 
obviously you're both Republicans. Um, just, you know, if the governor doesn't win re-election, how would you view that relationship working with either Stephen Height or Ammon Bundy? Well, I believe that they uh, will need extra help. <laughs> and no, I, w I will work well with anybody. Again, after the election, then we transition into managing the, f the affairs uh, of the state of Idaho. And that's what it's all about. We're not working for ourselves, we're working for uh, the entire population. Um, we also saw, speaking of the relationship between the governor and the lieutenant governor, on at least one occasion when Governor Little was out of state as acting governor, mm -hmm. Janice McGeehan issued an executive order that the governor didn't agree with, rescinded it, and then on a subsequent trip, the governor didn't give her power yeah. to take over as acting governor, even though the Constitution does say if the governor becomes ineligible to serve, including due to absence from the state or inability to discharge the powers and duties of his office, the lieutenant governor steps in. So my question is, when the governor leaves the state, who do you think should have acting power? Well, uh, you know, the courts have been silent on that up to this point, so we're at a we're at a crossroads, I guess, but I, it won't be me that pushes the issue to into the court system. I will be on the same page with the governor. Uh, the governor can trust me to carry out the the you know the agenda uh, while he's gone, and that's uh, and that's as it should be. I don't think you, it it helps our state to have the, the number one and number two being at cross purposes. So that's something that you never have to worry about with me. We will have the discussions way ahead of time and uh, when we get and when we uh, get on the same page or get on the, you know, have, make a decision, then you'll see me carrying that decision out. Uh, whichever person is the governor will never have to worry about me coming back over the top of them for political gain. We've seen um, past lieutenant governors have a, uh, <clears throat> uh, a special cause, say, that they focus on while they're in office. You know, for some ways, uh, Lieutenant Governor Little was a policy wonk and really dove into a lot of things for Governor Otter, including when the state was trying to develop um, affordable health care plan alternatives. Um, do you see yourself having a special issue that you're going to focus on, or it will be more broad range? Well, I have a broad background. I mean, I've been in the legislature for a while now and the Speaker of the House for 10, the last 10 years. And so, but I bring passion to a short list of issues. Number one, our water infrastructure in the state. Mm -hmm. We are growing and we have a finite amount of water and so how we, the decisions we make now on our basic infrastructure regarding water will, will shape our development and our growth into the future because we still live in the arid west and, there, and we can only expect a certain amount of water. Having said that, uh, we also have got infrastructure problems you know, well, not problems, but there are tensions, challenges, I think is probably a better word. There's more competition for every lane mile on our highway system. Our bridges need uh, to be maintained and up and, and kept up. Uh, but at the same time, our soft infrastructure in our, in our school system. You know, we've got to be mindful of that. We've got to, you know, we want to create a positive business climate here in Idaho. One that our, that our kids can uh, participate in, those that have moved away can move back. But that includes good schools. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, in, in my family, there have been decisions of whether we're going to move to this state or that state. And, and the job became a secondary issue. And the decision was based on uh, the school system that the kids would be moving into. And I think that that applies when people are looking at Idaho. Obviously, that has not stopped very many people from moving here. But I think that we, you know, constant care and feeding to our school system, our infrastructure system will make Idaho continue to be the success that it is. A final question on the role of the lieutenant governor. Um, you've been in the House for 22 years, but now you're going to be going to the other side in a way in the sense of presiding over the Senate. So what do you think the key is to being <clears throat> effective in that role? Well, number one, you've got to be prepared. So I, I mean, I bring some knowledge of the procedural stuff, and, uh, and it's very similar the, the way the Senate, you know, there'll be some nuanced changes, but I can handle that. 
In fact, I've said it a bunch of different times, the most relaxing part of my day as speaker was when I was in the chair. I can do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look forward to that, I enjoy it, I enjoy the, the parliamentary process, and, uh, and I, I'm looking forward to that. Well, we're going to take a quick break right now, and when we come back, more with Speaker of the House and candidate for Idaho Lieutenant Governor Scott Bedke on a couple of big issues in Idaho, including education and abortion. Stay, stay with us. And welcome back to Viewpoint. Today we're focusing on the race for Idaho Lieutenant Governor between Republican Speaker of the House Scott Bedke and Democrat Terry Pickens Manweiler. Pickens Manweiler will be my guest next Sunday. Once again, right now I'm joined by Speaker Bedke. This next question takes a little bit of setup, so bear with me here. Idaho, as you know, of course, has one of the strictest anti-abortion laws in the country. The only exceptions to the law being when an abortion can be performed to prevent death or when a survivor can provide a police report about rape or incest to police. A federal judge recently issued a partial pause on the law when it conflicts with the Federal Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, so doctors will not face criminal charges in these instances as state law must yield to federal law. A lot of legal speak there. The judge said the law backs, or lacks clarity for providers to be able to perform an emergency abortion. But I understand now, Mr. Speaker, that uh, you are appealing that decision that the judge handed down. Is that correct? Well, on behalf of the of the legislature, uh, yeah, we're we're uh, appealing to clarify some of the very things that you just brought up. My track record is clear. I'm pro-life, and I've always been pro-life. Uh, but I believe that uh, our, our policy should include uh, some exemptions. Obviously, when the my, life of the mother is at stake or in the cases, the rare cases of rape and incest. But if there, is, but if there are questions on miscarriage management, for example, or f uh, fertility issues or are those types of things, then I think that the legislature needs to take a pause and, and make sure that those areas are uh, in, encompassed in, in our policy. Some say it's in there, some say it doesn't, uh, it's not in there, and I think that, uh, that, that, it, should, that it should be in there. I, um, I'm, I'm against elective uh, abortion, but I believe that there are cases where we've got to trust the doctors mm -hmm. and trust the, the medical providers and uh, within a narrow scope of cases. So rather than appeal that judge's decision, why not go back in January and rewrite the law? <clears throat> well, because the, you know, the, the marching orders from the legislature were to appeal. Uh, but it, but if we're successful, we will end up where I've described. Now, I think that it may take both. It, it may take uh, the legislature revisiting these these questions, because I I believe that most Idahoans are pro-life, uh, but with the exceptions that that I have uh, described here. I'm a man of faith, and I believe that all life is sacred. But there are certain uh, continuing, ex, you know, there are certain circumstances where you've got to exercise some medical judgment. And um, Representative Lauren Nekachea tweeted yesterday saying, jaw dropping, <clears throat> Bedke and Winder are appealing a judge's decision to allow abortions to protect the health of pregnant Idahoans with medical complications. <laughs> Is that accurate? Well, I think that that's, a, that's twisting my position. Again, I've always been pro-life, uh, but I think that there is room in our policy and certainly in my thinking for uh, exceptions and common sense-based exceptions that have to include the life of the mother, the health, the reproductive health of the mother, and uh, in the cases of rape and incest. Do you think, though, the, you know, the, the issue with um, prosecuting doctors who perform abortions is no uh, well I mean if they're blatantly against the law but but I mean uh, where, where's that where there's that gray area no in and the, not in the gray area and if there's gray area then shame on the legislature for leaving gray area and I think that that gray area is where we need to be where I concentrating our efforts because I believe that everyone wants to have good uh, miscarriage management fertility management etc 
And uh, I mean, these are experiences that have happened to us in our immediate family. And I think that there needs to be room for, for the doctor to be the doctor. Okay. Well, I want to get your response to one more thing. And um, in a tweet also, your opponent, Terry Pickens Manweiler, said you would like to jail Idaho women for getting medical treatment. No. How do you respond? Well, that's absurd. Uh, and I, that's where I'm at. Okay. <laughs> Um, during the recent special legislative session, let's move on to education, um, on what to do with the state's $2 billion budget surplus. Lawmakers approved $410 million for Idaho public education. Democrats expressed some concerns that because that money wasn't you know, dedicated into a specific area of education, that, uh, that they say the Republicans could just take that money from somewhere else. Um, in January and you know basically take it out of that budget for the edu education. Do you see that happening? I do not see that happening. I see what we did in the special session as a signal to the, 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 the legislative session that will start in January as what our intentions are. Now we stopped, it's unappropriated money at this point and so the next legislature will decide who gets what and under what conditions but I didn't, but there was no pushback the, the concern at the legislature was that if the governor, uh, and with the powers that are vested in that office for special sessions, went into the legislative area and put the meets and bounds on the, on the money. And, and, and he did not. And, and, uh, and so that will be for the legislature that starts in January to do that. I think what it signals is that Idaho, again, is open for business. Not only did we tweak our tax code mm -hmm. to make ourselves more business friendly here, but we also tweaked or uh, signaled in the education area that we're open for business and that we want to always be found improving our system and uh, making investments in uh, you know, so that every kid can leave Idaho schools well prepared. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, I'm the grandfather of 14 kids, or grandkids. Each one of them, well, nearly every one of them are in the, in the public school systems here in Idaho. It's absolutely important to me that each one of those kids gets a good education. And when you think of $2 billion, <clears throat> you know, 400 million is what, 20% yeah. of that. Should it have been even higher? Because Idaho still lags behind way behind in, in funding compared to other states. Well, when you talk about that, you're talking about the inputs into education. Let's look at the outputs out of our education system. We have a system that is working pretty well. You know, we're, 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 we are well ranked in the outcomes with as far as the NAEP scores are concerned. And, uh, but we always, most of the money that goes into education goes into to salaries and benefits. Uh, and, you know, so we all understand that uh, every classroom has got to have a good teacher. Mm -hmm. And good teachers are well paid and well taken care of. If, if, if there are going to be people that give the state their career, mm -hmm. then they've got to be well compensated. Yeah, and following up on that too, um, for a long time Idaho has had a teacher shortage and yeah. retention and recruitment <clears throat> types of issues. Of that 400 million, I think actually, what is it, 330 million that's going into K through 12. Um, sh you're not going to be in the legislature, yeah. I realize that next year, but do you think you know, the largest chunk of that should go towards teacher pay and, and doing what you're talking about, keeping and, and <clears throat> Well, I think that, yeah, I, I, you know, that's a question for the next legislature. What we did was create a bucket, and on that bucket we put a sticky note. We didn't write an indelible marker of where it should go, but we put a sticky note on there that can be changed. In my opinion, and coming from rural Idaho, we have a hard time attracting teachers and keeping them there once they get there. And part of that, and part of the issue is compensation. We've taken huge steps in the past to make sure that, uh, that the health care benefit for all teachers is equivalent to the rest of state employees. We need to follow up on that. And, and every teacher needs to be well paid. We have to be, it has to be a profession that is attractive enough to, to make prospective teachers want to become teachers. And is technology also part of this component when you look at connectivity in rural areas? Well, absolutely. I mean, we all uh, are way more connected now than we've ever been before, and that includes the, the, the classroom. 
Keep in mind that the same inflationary things that our families are experiencing, so are our schools. And uh, so just to keep up with the costs of, of inflation in our schools, we need to always be found investing a little bit more there. But technology is, well, <laughs> is just look in front of you. I mean, it is part of our life. It is what we use now. It is a basic tool in everything we do, whether it's ranching or, uh, you know, television broadcasting. I mean, we use technology in a way we've never used it before. Yeah. And our kids need to be well-schooled in, uh, in using technology. And that means we've got to make investments so technology is available in the classroom. And then we've got to have somebody that is well-motivated and well-paid to teach them how to integrate technology into, their, into whatever field they go into. Um, I do want to ask, you know, you're leaving the house after... 22 years yeah. and uh, 10 years as, as speaker. How do you feel about the shape in which you're leaving the House after your leadership for a decade? Well, the House changes every two years, and so I don't know what this new House will look like, but I've really enjoyed my, my time in the House, and it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty rough and tumble place at times, but, then, uh, but it's also a place where we have a bunch of thoughtful people meet to solve our common problems. Uh, we are well served in Idaho with our current system. Every part of the state sends who they think, they, they send their first choice to Boise to go represent their interest. And if we get all of those interests or all of those different personalities pulling in the same direction, then we can do good things. You know, so I've always been one that has championed civility and the process and the using the process so that we can get the best ideas out of everyone. So what is your focus now, um, six weeks out from the election? You know, what's, the, what's it looking <clears throat> like for you as far as uh, your, your campaign in that final stretch? Well, we're, we're traveling the state. And, uh, and we're doing that uh, with a vengeance. I mean, we're going someplace every day to meet with as many people as we can. I think that one, it's, it's interesting that, you know, as I travel the state, as I get outside of the Treasure Valley and the Magic Valley, there are parts of our state that feel semi-detached from, from uh, uh, you know, the action or the, the epicenter of Idaho, or that's what they view it as. And I think that's one of the strengths that I'll have as the lieutenant governor is to connect those people back to our, you know, to the, you know, where the decisions are made and to bring their ideas and their issues back and so that we can better address those. Uh, you know, we are blessed to live in a beautiful state. And so it's always a pleasure just to drive up and down the road and to meet with the people, uh, their heart is always in the right spot. They're concerned about their families. They're concerned about inflation. They're concerned about their kids, and those are those are issues that I, you know, we all, you know, we all yeah. uh, think that. And so there's a lot of things we have in common. Well, I'm going to have to end it there, Mr. Speaker. We're almost out of time. Thank you so much for your time today and getting to really hear your stances and priorities and beliefs on these issues. Thank you, Doug. I'll be right back. And if you missed part of my interview with Speaker of the House and candidate for Lieutenant Governor Scott Bedke and would like to check it out, it will be posted on our website, ktvb.com. Also there, you can find my past interviews with Republican U.S. Senator Mike Crapo and his Democratic opponent, David Roth. And once again, next week, my guest will be Democratic candidate for Lieutenant Governor Terry Pickens Manweiler. That's all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you later today for the Sunday News at 4.30 and 10 p.m. And then right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint.